Let's have this discussion now. The head of the investigating director, that's advocate Herman Hronje, has one of the toughest jobs in the country, and that's to take the most serious forms of corruption and make sure that those who are corrupt are actually held to book while handling also the pressures to convict politicians involved in things like state capture. The directorate was established back in 2019 by President Cyril Ramaphosa to investigate and prosecute cases that are coming from the State Capital Commission of Inquiry, led, of course, by Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. So this Women's Month, we shine the spotlight on one of the most powerful prosecutors in the country that's tasked with going after so-called corruption masterminds, as well as the political elite and politicians themselves. With the Zondo Commission of Inquiry expecting President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, to make an appearance this week, how does the unit handle the pressure to convict the so-called political mighty while keeping her head down at least and getting down to the job. For that discussion, Advocate Hronya now joins us via our video link. And Advocate, it's great to see you. Thanks very much indeed for making time for us here on Politics Unscripted. Shall we jump straight into it? This task given to you is undoubtedly a difficult one. Is this the kind of job you take in any other context? Um, you know, I like to think of myself as someone who enjoys challenges, but um, for this particular challenge, uh, you, you have to have your head red when you actually put up your hand uh, for it. So I do regularly have my doubts. I do regularly wonder what I think I'm doing. Um, but it is an important job and a significant job and a job that I would rather be doing my best at trying than, than abandon. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And let's take a couple steps back if we can. I mean, you know, you have been at the NPA before. You left because of the circumstances in part, and mm -hmm. I have no doubt we'll ventilate that throughout the course of our discussion. But when you got that call from Advocate Shamila Batoy to head up the investigating directorate, given what you knew about the NPA, what went through your mind? So actually, when I got the call, I was in, in Tanzania. I was in Dar es Salaam on a, an assignment um, that I had with the World Bank and UNODC. I was assisting colleagues in the prosecution in, in um, Tanzania, doing exactly what I've uh, been given the opportunity to do, which is deal with serious corruption cases while trying to fix um, the prosecution service, while setting up an asset forfeiture unit. And, you know, I've been doing that for, for um, the World Bank and, and been traveling to a number of different countries. I've been in Sri Lanka, in um, uh, Nairobi. I've been to various countries looking at um, how in a developing country you can set up uh, institutions that, that can deal with corruption and, and endure beyond um, taking on, on powerful players in, in business and in government. Mm. Uh, let's speak a bit more about that. It's interesting you mentioned the, I guess, job you have to do and how that translates specifically in a developing country. Do these kind of investigations differ considering even perhaps how developed an economy is? I mean, you speak about, for instance, the political fallout of these investigations and their ability to destabilize a country. How high up your list of considerations is something like that as you do your job? So it, it, you know, having discussed with colleagues around the world, um, yeah, you know, there are a number of trajectories that that um, prosecuting high-profile corruption goes um, through. So either you successfully um, prosecute someone at the highest level, and um, you you sort of have the the, the short-term celebration of of of, of how um, well your organisation has achieved. And before you know it, though, the forces have gathered and destabilized. So typically, you know, Brazil is an example, Italy is another example, mm. where powerful politicians were held to account. But in the, the aftermath, the institutions that achieved that are slowly um, destabilized and, and, you know, muted. Um, so I think it's important to bear in mind that there's the job of, of holding individuals account, and then there's the job of ensuring that the organizations that we do it from are resilient and can endure beyond um, an individual prosecution. And but certainly work focusing on who it is that you're dealing with in, in the kinds of prosecutions you are trying to mount is a critical part of, of getting this job right.
Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you, I guess, do that in our context, how worried are you that, you know, our institutions might not be able to survive some of the investigations that you're currently busy with? So the interesting thing about that is, you know, I started in the NPA in 1998. I, I uh, pride myself as being the first employee of the new National Prosecuting Authority in South Africa. Uh, Bulelani Nuka was appointed um, the first national director, and I was working for him at the time in Parliament, and he asked me to join him in, in setting up this new institution. And so I had that vantage point, you know, looking at the prosecution uh, pre-1994 and, and looking at how Bulelani um, took on the task of shaping uh, the prosecution for the future. And it was a hugely exciting time because um, Bulelani had the sort of moral authority and credibility to make huge changes that were, were long overdue in the prosecution. Um, and, and he went about you know, um, instilling um, and bringing about changes that, that endured for a very long time. But um, he himself uh, didn't stay the, the, the distance. In 2010, I, I, I stayed in the MPA beyond his departure. Mm. Um, around 2010, um, I got to a point where I needed to make a, a call about, can I, in the way the institution is functioning at the moment, continue to make a difference? And I, I came to a very uh, depressing conclusion that I didn't find that there was space. Um, for me to do my job um, and make a difference. And so I thought, um, I'll leave, I'll go to the private sector and, and gather skills, different skills, do my time um, in the private sector and, and look at, at this problem from outside of the NPA because while I was in it, I was really struggling to, to see how, how we could change things. Fast forward to 2018 when I get the call and I'm asked, um, do you want to come back and, and give it another shot? Um, you know, this is what I've spent my whole life working towards, you know, being in a position to, to, to do this kind of work. And so knowing that the challenges are now even, even more, um, even harder than they were in 2010 or, or, or 1998, I thought, you know, I'll be in a position in which I can um, bring about changes. Um, so let me go back and, and be part of a new team that can um, turn this thing around, ever the optimist. Um, mm. And I think that, um, I, you know, I, I keep saying that I think we are at our lowest point, right? That, but um, in terms of the challenges that we face, um, but I every day I see um, what can be done. I see the, the opportunities to really make a difference. And so for that reason, I say, there are of course also days when I despair and I think, is this even possible? But, uh, you know, my, my message to my staff um, often is, we just dare not fail. You know, there are no other options. So we have to give it our best shot and we have to make the most of, of what the opportunities that present um, themselves to us. And, and that's how we take one day at a time. Sure. And they always say that eating a big elephant is one bite at a time. So that makes a lot of sense, at least to me. But let's speak mm -hmm. a bit more about the moments that led up to your deciding to initially leave the NPA. Bringing down an institution like that doesn't happen in a day. It takes several years in some instances. And so many might rightly say that you must have seen it coming before finally making the decision to eventually leave. What was the tipping point for you? Strangely, um, the tipping point was not um, a, a case-related decision, although those had happened. You know, I, I, I spent a year at Harvard, so I had a break from being in the NPA, but I was still in constant communication uh, with my staff in the asset forfeiture unit at the time, who were, do, who were dealing with the arms deal cases back then. Um, and a decision had been taken by the then, um, I think he was acting national director at the time, Menzi Similani, to withdraw an asset forfeiture application that we had been able to bring to court in, in what I maintain to this day were, were very dubious circumstances. 
and I agonized a lot about um, that decision and what I would do. And I, I seriously considered mm -hmm. then re resigning from the NPA and citing that as my as the reason for my resignation. Um, and I thought, um, you know, I talked to lots of people who who said, you know, so you have your one moment of oh, you've resigned, and then you know you leave the institution for people to 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 do the things that you worried they're going to do. So stay and and make um, your changes from within. Then uh, Willie Hoffmeyer was my boss at the time. You know, felt very strongly that that's the way to go. To you can't leave the institution. You can't abandon the institution to people you don't trust. Um, what was the tipping point for me actually was I was sitting in in interviews for junior and senior state advocates in the asset forfeiture unit. And it was a it was an opportunity to bring in young black women men into the institution um, and build a new ethos in the institution. And the people on the panel um, had had a different um, mission. Their mission was to appoint people who are going to be loyal to their cause. And so they had no interest in who were the most talented, who who would make the best contribution. They were interested in who would do who would appreciate how they got their jobs and who gave them their jobs and they would do their bidding. Mm. And for me, when I lost out that fight on 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 who to appoint in the asset forfeit unit, I just felt like if I can't shape a culture with people that I want to work with, then really I'm not going to be able to do this work. And and that is actually what prompted me to leave, um, in addition to all the other things that were going on at the time. Yeah. Well, you speak about the opportunity to have, I guess, young black women join the NPA. I wonder how bothered you are that we still speak about female firsts in a profession like yours. We'll ask that question and plenty others for you when we come back. This is Politics Unscripted. We're in conversation with the head of the investigating directed advocate, Hermione Nkronia. Those discussions still to come. Stay with us. We're in conversation as part of the talking point with the investigating directed head, advocate Herman Hornier, who joins us via our video link. And advocate, just before we went for that quick breather, you and I were about to ventilate, I guess perhaps some of the optics uh, around the job you do on a month like this especially. Typically, what would happen is that many of us, as well as my other colleagues, would be making calls to powerful women to give us a sense of how they feel we fared as a country when it comes to at least empowering women and essentially giving them what's due to them. Before that quick breather, you were ventilating that part of the breaking point for you was when there was an opportunity to empower women within the NPA, and that didn't happen. However, fast forward a couple of years later, we still speak about female firsts in the kind of work and the field that you're in. Does that bother you? Do you find those conversations to be helpful or largely still futile? I mean, it, but it, the way I understand your question is, um, is it frustrating that we, we, we're still celebrating when a woman is the first in, you know, person in that field to, to occupy a position of influence and authority? Right. Then I think, um, so, you know, you, you say, are we giving women their due? Um, I'm a firm believer in, in no one's going to give women their due. Women are going to have to assert their due and um, embrace their due um, because it's never going to be handed to us on a platter. So, you know, I, I believe in uh, creating the opportunities and especially creating the opportunities for women who, who believe that they are doing the thing they should be doing and want to excel at doing that thing. Um, if the question is, are men um, making it difficult for us? Um, I, I think definitely. I, I don't think any man um, decides, okay, this is a woman I don't want to work with uh, because she's a woman. Mm. Men are, are acculturated to find it very hard to take seriously um, a woman in authority. So, you know, at every turn, I do find that I have to deal with men who um, believe that it's not my place to be able to um, interact with them as an equal, especially in, in the environment of cr criminal justice. On a daily basis, I find I have to work twice as hard, be um, on top of things, uh, 
far more than my, my male counterparts because when they speak, they expect to be listened to and they expect to be taken seriously. I do too, but it doesn't come as naturally yeah. <laughs> to because of our society and our culture. So that's an ongoing daily struggle that I think we as women um, will continue to, to fight. Right, right. And many people might also say, does having a Shamila Batoy essentially as your boss help, or is that too tall a ask for any one individual to try fix? So um, does it help to have a female boss? Um, I think that the more women who occupy positions of authority, the better. So the more younger women can see, well, there's no impediment um, to a, women, a woman occupying any position um, in society, just like, you know, there ought to be no impediment to a person of color, you know, um, disabled people, transgender people, that in a, in a diverse society, everyone must be given the opportunity, um, uh, if, they, if they are suitable, to occupy those positions. So, so on a personal level, it's good to um, have a, a, a female boss because we, we will be able to share um, experiences when we see a man sort of disregarding us just mm. because it's a woman, we can sort of look at each other and recognize, okay, here we go again, let's just fix this bit of, of being mm. asserting ourselves. So no, the more women they are, the more you, you have that shared sense of, okay, we're not tolerating sexist behavior in the boardroom or, or the, the meeting room. And when a man decides to talk over a woman or to disregard what she's just said, um, you know, there's more support for saying that's not acceptable. Um, so, yes, it does help to have a, a female boss. Sure. Point taken. Let's shift gears a bit and speak perhaps about the lessons learned till this point. 38 million rand was the initial budget when the investigating directorate was being put together. Um, what was the plan back then and how much of that plan do you reckon is still in place? So the plan right in the beginning was the Zonda Commission was busy doing its work. And part of its work is to make recommendations, well, firstly to investigate state capture, and then to make recommendations that will ensure that state capture doesn't um, repeat itself. And part of that is to look into the functioning of the criminal justice system. So the idea was while the Zonda Commission is, is doing its work and investigating and, and when it comes up with recommendations, it will set the agenda for how going forward uh, the criminal justice system will be set mm -hmm. up to, to deal with these challenges. The, so the plan was that the investigating director would, would be sort of an interim stopgap measure. It would take a couple of cases, which were our high profile corruption cases, bring them to court and quickly put people in orange overalls. Right. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the budget and the infrastructure was, was just, um, was not focused on building a whole um, infrastructure to support um, big case corruption cases. It was sort of an interim measure. I think what we're now realizing is high profile complex corruption cases is going to be a feature of the work that the National Prosecuting Authority does for a long time to come. And so we need to put in place um, the, the building blocks of, a, of an institution that is equal to that task and, and can endure beyond taking on one or two um, high profile uh, people. Mm. So the, the, the picture is changing. Of course, there is still um, the moment that we'll get the recommendations um, from the Zondo Commission, but I think it, within the NPA, we have realized that really the lessons we've learned in the last two years around how to reorganize the criminal justice system is probably incredibly valuable and that those lessons are what must feed into the solutions. So, so we have spent, a, a, you know, in addition to trying to bring prosecutions to court, we have spent a lot of time thinking through how to rebuild. Um, and how to, to get us into a position where we can do a big, complex, high-profile corruption cases. And how is that process coming along? The, the scaffolding, essentially, of what the NPA ought 
to look like. I imagine a big part of that task is obviously capacitating the NPA, a difficult mm. job in a context where there are budget cuts. Yes. Um, so, so I would say that um, for me, the most important uh, aspect, the thing that I've learned in the last two years, is that the prosecution faces many challenges. Some um, are challenges that any prosecution in the world faces, especially prosecutions in developing countries where there's a shortage of resources. The problem is huge, you know, and, and in that context, prosecuting authorities around the world pride themselves on, on not dispensing justice selectively. So prosecution services around the world do not want to um, prioritize and select cases because everybody is entitled to justice. The challenge with that approach is you are then overwhelmed, mm. you know, and, and you're left at the mercy of, of a whole range of other factors as to what cases eventually do make it to court. So you, you're striking this difficult balance between saying we're going to select cases um, and prioritize those cases and see them through the system, but at the same time, you have to satisfy the public and, and those people who, who end up being targeted um, that, that the criteria you use to select them was fair and just and, and um, not politically motivated, not um, um, motivated by some other ulterior agenda. And that's the, that's the real challenge for uh, one set of challenges for the prosecution. The other set of challenges for the prosecution is that the world is a dramatically different place from what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Crimes are predominantly committed um, through digital means, you know, online. Um, you know, the old um, assault, murder, rape, and robbery are still there, but financial crime and, and cyber crime is at a level, um, an unprecedented level, and prosecution services and investigations capacities are, are lagging behind, right, and need a, a, a tremendous catapult into the, the future. So that's the second um, set of challenges that we're sort of working with archaic um, practices, mm. but approaching modern problems. So, you know, those are the problems that the, the, the National Prosecuting Authority faces, that any National Prosecuting Authority faces. Add the growing alarm around levels of corruption, add the, the socioeconomic challenges that we face, the, you know, gross inequality, and you really mm -hmm. have um, a nightmare of a task. But I think there are also within that lots of opportunities. So the one thing I, I always say about the Zondo Commission, you know, while the work it did to uncover and reveal to us um, what happened during state capture is, um, is its crowning achievement, but there's a secondary achievement um, that is not as well known. The Zondo Commission set up a digital forensics capability to help it process the data um, around state capture and, and on social media. Um, that is a capability that law enforcement in South Africa had not um, had and certainly um, doesn't have. And, and so our job now is to bring that capability on board and um, gear it to be sort of mainstream um, uh, technology that the, the National Prosecuting Authority uses in, in investigating and prosecuting complex uh, cases. So, you know, there are huge challenges, but there are also huge opportunities within that. So for me, you know, the story I was telling you about why I left, what I'm most excited to do is to be on platforms like this and, and give this message to young um, legal professionals um, looking for jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Especially talented ones. Um, I want them to know that your first choice shouldn't automatically be some big fancy law firm. Your first choice should be the prosecution because they, there is no better place to get the kind of skills you need to do any kind of legal job. You know, you have litigation, court time, second to none. You have um, opportunities to learn, second to none. And you, you get to do satisfying work. And initially, the pay is comparable, right? It's, it's as you go up in, in your career in the legal profession that the private sector may offer more 
um, better remuneration, but the job satisfaction remains second to none in the prosecution. So, you know, that's what we need to build. Um, we need to bring in young people with with the experience of, of uh, being as fluid and fluent with technology as they are to come into this archaic institution and just breathe new life in it so that it, it can um, deal with these challenges. Sure. I wonder in a context where a lot of crimes, as you've explained, take place in the cyberspace, what evidence collection actually looks like. We'll ventilate that aspect of our discussion as we continue speaking to advocate uh, Hermione Fournier. She's the head of the investigating directorate within the NPA. A mandate in some respects they've give given to complete within five years. Is that time enough? Well, we'll ask her when we come back. And as part of the talking point with investigating directorate head advocate Hermione Fournier, who joins us via our video link. And uh, advocate Fournier, we're just, uh, before we went to that quick breather, ventilating how the world essentially has changed and how that, I guess, informed ways through which you need to do your own work as an investigative body. If most crimes, or perhaps if a lot of the complex crimes taking place are now occurring in the cyberspace, help us understand what evidence collection looks like in that context. Um, typically, you know, the, call it uh, the old fashioned ways of committing crimes, if that's even a term I can use, would have people leaving hardcore evidence in the form of perhaps paper trails, emails, things that have been printed. But if a lot of the financial crimes are taking place on the internet, you're able to cover your tracks in a much more complex fashion than you would perhaps even five years ago. Absolutely, uh, but I, I think um, one of the most visible ways in which um, mm. uh, the work we do has changed. I remember um, traveling in the early days of the Scorpion um, to investigative agencies uh, in the U.S. and in the U U.K. with with Bulilani Nuka. And one of the things that you know you would notice then is investigators are are not desk. Um, they're not people who sit behind desks. You know, there's the, the stereotype that a good cop is not someone who pushes paper um, at his desk. Mm. He's someone out there, and him, typically. Um, but, you know, when I, uh, I visited the UK recently, and I visited the Serious Fraud Office and the National um, Crime Centre, and what you, what you found was the police, police officers, investigators, are sitting in warehouses with desks and computers. So investigators, each hundreds of cubicles with, uh, in police officers be, sitting behind their computers doing their work, doing their investigation, right? So that's the first, like, um, obviously police officers still have to go out there and interview suspects and, and, and interview witnesses, but the bulk of the work is, be, is done behind computers. The bulk of the work is looking at um, large data sets. Right, whether it's bank statements, cell phone communications, um, email communications, uh, WhatsApp communications, and you know those volumes are enormous. You'll know, you know, when you're looking for something in your own inbox, mm. um, you, know, you can spend a long time because there's so much going on in there. And so multiply that um, millions of times, and you'll get a sense of how it is about finding a needle in a haystack, right? That is the crucial either email or document or, or, or the properties of a document that show you actually that document, while it purports to have been created in 2010, was actually created in 2020. And, and so that, um, the, the skill set is about um, artificial intelligence. It's about finding ways to get search engines to find data um, and, and refine searches and have people look at. So you, you have this clash going on um, constantly in my office, right, where the prosecutor says to the investigator, okay, so let me, uh, bring me the file, right? Let me see the docket, let mm. me going through. And the investigator looks at the prosecutor and says, if I were to print the material <laughs> that is in the docket, we would look at multiple um, soccer fields of, of, of um, paper. So, no, there isn't a printable docket. You know, you, you have to go onto an e-discovery platform and you have to familiarize yourselves with the tool 
and you have to, you know, read and peruse your docket online, I'm afraid. Sure. Um, yeah. And does that make the job easier or harder? I mean, I still know people who, for instance, prefer having books held in their fingers, or rather having, yeah, a hard book to read and peruse through because they, they just feel that it enables them to engage with the content in a whole lot more of a meaningful way. Now that you're working with what you're calling e-files, how does that sort of translate in terms of the time it actually takes you to get through something like that? So that's why I, I think we need more young people in the yeah. prosecution because young people you know, when last did, did a young person ask for a printer to print something out? You know, only if, if some teacher actually really demands that they don't submit the assignment online. So, so young people are living in that world, right? Older, more experienced prosecutors, and I'm one of them, you know, and I'm one of those people who believe that I have to have my book in my hand, um, have to adapt. And we, we, we're having to make very difficult adaptations, right? So my, my preferred team has a young person and, and an experienced person, and they both um, are sharing skills because the young person knows how to navigate the digital world, and the more experienced prosecutor knows what it takes to, to cross-examine a witness, to lead evidence in court. Um, so, you know, we, we, we need both, and we need to adapt um, on all fronts. Sure. Speaking about what it takes to complete some tasks, there's been a lot of conversation, of course, on the back of the uh, unrest we've seen in the country around what it actually takes to have a treason charge stick. And that's for a whole lot of reasons. I mean, people were saying what has happened in the country is largely treasonous. Let's hear it from you. If you were to put together a case for something like treason, what evidence do you reckon is a non-negotiable? So... I'm a, a corruption expert, not a treason expert. Sure. Um, but I think, um, and I, but I think similar things apply in taking a big, complex case to court, um, and and why it's been uh, proving so difficult to take those cases to court. So you know, often I get this um, uh, people saying to me, "But the Zondo Commission, you know, has demonstrated so and so is guilty. Why don't you just arrest him and bring him before court?" Um, and, and the issue is that it's a lot more difficult to um, uh, prosecute someone when you're saying, firstly, the charge you're putting is going to have serious consequences for that person. They, they may go to jail. So uh, unlike in the Zondo Commission where people come and testify and there's very little um, consequence for them, other than if they're not telling the truth, they can end up um, being prosecuted for perjury. But, um, you know, the Zonda Commission is not going to make a finding of, of innocence or guilt. And so people are less invested in challenging. But, you know, even there people have challenged. So modern um, prosecutions, modern corruption co prosecutions are really about the guilt or ev uh, innocence of the person being charged. They are 95% about how the investigation and prosecution were conducted. So literally in a prosecution, the investigator and every step the investigator took in the process of investigating and every decision the prosecutor makes is put on trial. Um, and because the evidence is so overwhelming that that's, the, that's what um, powerful accused people and their lawyers revert to, mm. um, deflect from the fact that the evidence is fairly overwhelming. And we've seen, you know, the second thing that we've seen is that the challenge um, that you will face in even putting that charge, getting a person before court so that you can read out the charge sheet and say, what do you plead, guilty or not guilty? You have months of, of interlocutory, years of interlocutory, in some cases almost 20 years of interlocutory applications to stall the commencement of a criminal trial. So, so as a as as a corruption um, anti-corruption outfit out to prosecute in that context, um, you know we've had to to you know start from scratch. Saying okay, you know the conventional approach that prosecutors have is we have to put our charge sheet has to cover the full spectrum of what happened here. You know, so in a state capture context, we have to 
focused on all the wrongdoing um, that happens. And, and the, the consequence there is you have a charge sheet that goes into, into many Leva Arch files if you're still printing them out. Um, and, um, and the point is that we, we found that we actually have to keep it really simple. Mm. We have to go for the most straightforward um, charge. So for example, uh, that, that requires little uh, by way of testimony so that witnesses don't get interfered with all those kinds of things. So, so, and we get told, why don't you try the, the Al Capone model? So we'll, we, we, we've decided in some cases, let's just put a straightforward tax fraud charge because this person received a bribe and yes, we have a corruption charge, but actually they, the money came into their bank account and they spent it as, as income. So, and they didn't declare that income. So it's an open and shut uh, tax evasion charge. We've tried a few of those. You know, yeah, and yeah. they don't come to court. They they don't get to the point where you plead because first they'll challenge the charge sheet, then they'll challenge the the discovery, then they then when all else fails, the morning of the hearing, the the legal representative is is fired, or then there's no funds to pay the legal representative, so he excuses himself or she excuses herself because there are no instructions. So you know you're trying to. In, in a fairly dysfunctional space, um, trying to pin things down so that there's no room to maneuver. Um, and that's why it's challenging. But I, I do think we are understanding the problem better and we're getting um, much better at focusing our indictments and accepting that, you know, people can only go to jail for 15 to 20 years. So there's no point in bringing charges that will get them um, convicted and incarcerated for a hundred years. They're not going to live that long. So right. focus on on getting a straightforward charge and getting that charge fixed, um, and getting the person to plead and getting someone in orange overalls. Sure, but it's yeah, easy. whilst we speak about that, that procedure, I mean, in my mind, all those steps are there to ensure that everybody is treated fairly, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. But to what extent do you reckon those different routes are actually pretty counterproductive? They're leading to a, a much more dysfunctional uh, justice system than not. And I think these are challenges our colleagues around the world face. Mm. You know, the, the average corruption investigation takes between four to six years. I'm saying that not to freak people out, but the truth is they often take longer, right? And then and 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 the average corruption trial will take another six years or so. And you know, by then, by the time you actually get around to leading the evidence, you know, witnesses have are all dead, long forgotten, um, you know, the issues. So so th this is a, a challenge around the world that justice um, needs to be speedier and we need to find ways to, to ensure fairness, ensure that we don't um, uh, incarcerate people who are innocent, but at the same time, um, find ways to get to the heart of the matter and not, not spend so much resources on fighting um, side issues, which, which you know, we, we spend a lot of time doing in the criminal justice system at the moment. Yeah, one particular case comes to mind, but I'll behave. I won't necessarily say much. Advocate Hermine Ronier is our guest on The Talking Point on this uh, today's episode of Politics Unscripted. When we come back, we're hoping to hone in on what the ID, the investigating directorate, actually has to show for the months that it's been in operation. That part of the discussion. We also still with the acting, I mean, the uh, head of the investigating director, that's advocate uh, Herman Hornier, who joins us via our video link. A and advocate, uh, we were hoping to speak now about what we have to show for the investigating director, given the time that has lapsed so far. A large part of our discussion have been around how the world has changed and how that's perhaps complicated your work. But with that in mind, what tangible successes do you reckon exist today? I know, so this, I mean, what we get measured by is how many state capturers are in orange overall. Right. And by that check, we have not done very well at all. Um, but I think that there is room for a broader conversation about the impact that we've had as an investigating directorate. 
So, you know, we, we, each of our cases, the key difference between the investigating directorate and conventional law enforcement is con conventional law enforcement requires you to go into a police station and, and make a complaint and then a docket is opened and the investigation then um, is about proving um, uh, or disproving the allegations and the complaints. We, we have a, had a different approach, right? We've looked at um, was there capture of key institutions of state. So we've looked at the criminal justice system, for example, the police, the NPA, the state security agency. Um, and obviously in, the, in, in assessing whether there was capture and what capture looked like and the extent of capture, we've been greatly assisted by the Zondra Commission. That's where the real uh, interrogation has happened, right? The real in, in investigation. But at the end of the day, that's intelligence, right? That gets handed over to us that we need to convert into admissible evidence in court. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, with the, what, what we in the last two years have developed quite a, a rich and strategic sense of where capture took place, how it took place, and even who the, the evidence points to are the people who perpetrated um, that corruption. Where we are at now is, you know, we, 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 pull, we bring together charge sheets. Um, I mean, a good example is the regiment um, uh, case. There we acted fairly early on because there was um, about a billion rand moving and we wanted to be able to act to secure that billion rand um, before it, it disappears. So we were nowhere near ready to bring our charges. Our, our understanding of what happened um, with regiments uh, at a number of, of SOEs was was still at an early stage, right? But in an asset forfeiture application, we put what we had before court and we managed to secure um, an interim restraint order. And, and what that case did is um, 600 million could immediately um, be uh, set aside for the um, second defined benefit fund. So the Transnet pension fund um, received 600,000 rand of the money that we had targeted. We ultimately suffered a setback in that case because the court said we didn't uh, make disclosure of all the evidence at our disposal or material evidence. Our argument was, we put all the material evidence, but of course there were tons more evidence that mm. we would not be able to put before court. So that issue is is on appeal at the moment, and and we're about to to have the appeal argued by um, before full bench. In, but it what it what it shows is that you know in that case we were able to um, act to bring back some money. We we've we've done other cases in cooperation with our partners. So ABB, for example, paid ESCOM back 1.6 billion, we had a role to play in bringing uh, that, those funds before court. SARS um, has been able to seize uh, in relation to uh, China South Rail, in relation to the 1064 um, low-cost contract, uh, in excess of, of 1.6 billion, and, and there's more to come. So, so we have been able to target um, the proceeds of crime and, and find creative ways with our partners in the criminal justice system to, to make sure um, uh, money is recovered. Um, but there's a lot more to be done. And, and I think that we're looking at a lot of innovative, innovative ways to try and um, short circuit the time it takes to bring these cases to court and the time it takes to have these cases you know, argued through the system. I am particularly proud of, of the charge sheets that we've put out. So, so when I came in, back in, I was very bright eyed and bushy tailed and I undertook that, you know, we won't just arrest people and then you have endless postponements for the next 10, 20 years for, for further investigation and the case just doesn't come to trial. I, I made it clear to my team that when we arrest someone, we are ready to um, hand over a complete charge sheet or a complete indictment. We hand over the full docket and we say, we are ready um, for this trial to be set down. And if you know you bring your interlocutory applications, but we are ready to proceed to trial. Right. And right. 
in a number of cases we've been able to do that. Um, and, you know, the, yeah, but the system um, needs us to be far more thoughtful, far more proactive in trying to anticipate some of the challenges to um, getting a trial to start. And, and that's where we're doing a lot of work and winning a lot of um, smaller battles that don't necessarily have them walking off uh, in orange overalls, but certainly they're the building blocks that are going to get us there sooner rather than later. Right. I wonder how much of what the State Capture Commission of Inquiry can do is able to assist you. Let me phrase that differently. Is there anything that the State Capture Commission of Inquiry can do differently to assist you in your tasks? Mm, I think that um, um, I'm very keen for them to complete their work like everybody else. <laughs> right. Right? Because, because that frees up people who can then um, spend time applying themselves to a different question. Not um, what happened, but how do we hold accountable those we found to be responsible? Um, and so, you know, I have been fortunate to, to now increasingly get on board uh, people who did a lot of this work in the Zonda Commission. And, and now they're going to work with prosecutors and investigators um, in doing what I've described earlier, identifying um, focus cases that, that will have the kind of impact we have, that we can take to court uh, in an expedited uh, fashion, you know, reduce um, charges, reduce evidence so that things can happen far more speedily. Mm. Uh, and so that, you know, that people who come with an understanding of what happened during the state capture years and how the offenses were committed and who the role players were, uh, can assist us and, and expedite that process. So the only, uh, yeah, uh, I, there's very little I can do to fault the way the commission has done its work, given its brief. You know, sure, sure. I've done South Africa a huge service, and we will take that work and be able to far more effectively convert that into um, accountability. Not as fast as everyone would like, but certainly um, we're hoping to do it much faster than around the world um, it's been done. With that in mind, the president is said to make an appearance at the State Capital Commission of Inquiry in the week to come. Is there anything in particular that you're hoping the State Capital Commission of Inquiry might be able to gain from that? Um, I, I think, so. you know, what South Africa can gain from that is, is a discussion around how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Right. You know, how do we build our institutions, the prosecution, the investigations, you know, the front line of, of defense, um, the state security agency, the, the, the police and, and the prosecution? How do we build capacity and capability that can withstand um, the, the attempts at capture that we've seen um, and endure uh, and, and do the job that they are meant to do, which is protect us from the kind of um, corruption that we have seen and are seeing. Yeah. Very quickly, with the few seconds we have left, Advocate, you've been given five years to essentially get all of this done. Is that anywhere near enough time? Perhaps the answer is no. And if not, how much more time do you reckon would be needed to finish something like this? So I don't know that a project like this is ever done, right? Because new challenges come, you know, in the time that I've been here, you know, it started out with state capture was so horrific. Then we had um, uh, the, the PPE scandal. You know, we, we've had, now we have um, the sort of insurrection or, or, or you know, um, the unrest that we've had um, over the last few months. So they, they are always new challenges um, and so the job is to constantly keep building and keep um, capacitating the system so that it can deal with these challenges not just as a crisis you know and set up a crisis committee here and a crisis director there but as something um, as an institution that understands that these are the challenges that it will have to grapple with going forward and gear itself and be prepared and be equipped to to face those challenges. So I'm afraid um, five years will come and go, but the challenges will continue to be there and the opportunities to make big differences um, remain. 
the hour we have together was never going to be enough to cover the full depth and scope of what you do. But let me thank you for your time nonetheless. Really do appreciate your generosity. Advocate Hermione Honya there. She's the head of the investigating directorate within the NPA joining us for the Talking Point.